Welcome to the Not the Andrew Marr Show. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. We've got a really busy show. Uh, we've got a newspaper review to start, as we always do. And then we have a discussion about the NEC election results. So um, uh, I hope you've all had a good breakfast. Or if you're eating, can you put yourself off video so we don't see you? Uh, and I'm going to start by introducing one of our newspaper reviewers. Uh, who's making her second appearance on the show uh, from Momentum's National Committee, I think is the name. Uh, Shanali, are you there? Hello, Crispin. How are you this morning? I'm I'm good. Yeah, I'm 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 uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, this show and um, and finding out more about what's what people think about the NEC election result. Yes. Uh, Commiserations, by the way. Oh well, you ran a I great campaign. I wasn't expecting to to get on. Um, it was a bit, bit of a bit of a tough, tough, uh, tough fight against the 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 uh, slates. Now, what what I need to do now is find our second reviewer who's in there somewhere, but it keeps being moved around by people. Um, John Dunn, are you there, John Dunn? I'm here, yes. I'm here and well. Uh, great. Right. So, so, so you're 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 ready to go with the newspaper per reviews as well. I am. It's the first time I've read anything out of a newspaper for years. Uh, yeah. The last time I read a newspaper, I was so horrified by the front page about that evil uh, Freddy Star eating that hamster. I could never buy another uh, newspaper again. All right. So, so. Uh, I hope we don't disturb you too much uh, with this one. Uh, the first, the first story that I thought you could uh, discuss with, was this uh, about Ten Downing Street, all this intrigue with um, uh, what's his name, Cummings and uh, Boris Johnson uh, and Boris Johnson's uh, partner, fiance. Sorry, um, John. Do you have strong opinions on this? I don't really, because I think one tour is as bad as another. So, you know, uh, Cummings might have gone, you know, Cummings is going. Uh, but, uh, you know, he'll be replaced by another heartless bastard as well. And, and all this, he said, she said, he didn't like uh, Boris's fiancé, this. I think, it, you know, that takes us away from the real point, that the Tories are consuming themselves because they've got no opposition. They're feeding off their own, uh, you know, off their own uh, spawn almost because, they, you know, nobody's opposing them. So they, they're collapsing inwards. And uh, it's more a sign of that, I think, uh, and the fact that the Tories' internal divisions, if you like, are now coming to the fore. Again, because, you know, we've got a national government with the Stammeroids supporting them. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Shanali, what, what's your view on this? Yeah, I mean, I've got to echo John's points, actually. It's all a load of flim-flam, isn't it, really? It's a massive distraction. We're supposed to be interested in this supposed sort of, you know, back, you know, the drama behind the doors of number 10. We're not interested in this, are we? It makes no impact upon our lives whatsoever. Why are we being shown this? Why aren't we talking about the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that Dominic Cummings was at the heart of, a, a catastrophic herd immunity program and that we've now got over 50,000 people dead in this country highest highest covid death rate in europe i mean it's this is a load of it's a massive distraction isn't it yeah it's something like you'd think that it's like something from the royal royal intrigues of the medieval age you know with, yeah. uh, that you know like and then boris is going to get someone's head cut off or something like that uh, look at this plebs don't look at this look at this that's basically yeah it. yeah and it's all over the papers i have to say i looked at all the all of the papers have got this through number of pages in, in each paper so um but then i saw in the observer this story um that gets a side column um which i thought was interesting it's a little side column pandemic will double demand for council homes there's going to be a massive uh number of people who get kicked out of 
they're um, evicted at from private properties because of because of what's happening. Um, what's your what's your view on on what's going to happen? What do you think Labour needs to do with this, Shanali? Well, this actually is really pertinent to my being on Momentum's NCG because we launched a national eviction resistance campaign um, a few weeks ago in response to what exactly what this article is talking about. We're, we're facing a tsunami of homelessness because of the, the lifting of the eviction ban in September. Um, as this article points out, like t thousands and thousands of people are in rent arrears because of the pandemic. Loads and loads and loads of people are facing um, eviction notices and those are going through the courts now. And by March, we're really, really worried that there's going to be an absolute tidal wave of homelessness. Um, so yeah, what should Labour be doing on it? Labour should be um, should be um, demanding that the Section 21 so-called no-fault eviction notices are, str are scrapped. Um, they should be supporting um, mass social housing building, which obviously was in the last manifesto. We would have been building more social housing than since 1945 if, if Corbyn had got in, obviously. Um, and we need to be calling for not rent um, mortgage. So mortgage payments have been, um, you know, during the pandemic, um, uh, people have been given a holiday, but rent renters um, have not been given the equivalent, which essentially should be a rent, a rent holiday. Otherwise, people's debt is mounting up and they're falling more and more into debt and they're facing the, the you know, the catastrophe of mass homelessness. So Labour needs to be coming out really strong on this. We've already seen like homelessness has already become such a horribly commonplace part of British life. I live in East London. Um, you go to Stratford now, uh, where the massive shopping centre is, and opposite there's a tent city. I mean, it's it's sort of unimaginable that this has become something that we're all supposed to just be used to. Like we need to be shouting really loud about this. Yeah. Join the campaign. I'll say I'll put the link in the chat shortly. Join the anti join the eviction resistance campaign. Great. Well, thank you, uh, John. What do you well, think about, about this story? Well, I think irrespective of the pandemic, the issue of decent housing at affordable rents is the cornerstone to any welfare state. I was pleased, uh, as has just been mentioned, that a commitment to build council houses, and we should always call them council houses. They're not social housing. They're not a benefit. They're not for unfortunate people and disadvantaged people. The communities where real people should live and real people should thrive. So I think we, we need to, uh, Labour needs to get housing back on its agenda. It was really the, the Blairites took it out when literally they privatised council housing by forcing councils uh, by only funding uh, housing associations and, and starving councils of funds. And now you've got the situation where people who have to move into private rented accommodation are paying extortionate rents, could never get on this so-called magical property ladder because most of their income is going on, uh, on rent and we've not been building council houses. And, and that, it's the thing that's dear to my heart because in a previous incarnation, I was a Claycross councillor and we got surcharged for defending uh, council housing way back in the 70s. And we had a commitment to council housing as a social provision. It didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter if you're a manager, a, a, a labourer, whatever, you could have a council house and be part of a, a community. Uh, and we need to get back to the idea that we're going to rebuild communities, not build vast sprawling estates and sky high skyscrapers, but give people gardens, open spaces, relaxation areas. And if the pandemic does open up a discussion about what's wrong with housing, then that's perhaps one of the few good things that might come out of it. The Tory answer to a housing problem is to, is to make planning laws easy so their donors can, uh, can rake the landscape and build more and more cardboard box type houses 
for people to, to live in. We've got to put it central to the agenda of, of labour now because these communities used to function, used to be thriving, and, we, and, and, and were where local people felt they had a safe haven and, and could live in some sort of comfort. So we have to have to get back to that. And yeah, right. we should build, Labour should have a commitment not to build a few hundred thousand, to build a million council houses every year and scrap the high rents and linking them to the private sector. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on because we haven't, we haven't got very much time. And that is, there's there's a lot going on in the papers I noticed about vaccines. Suddenly vaccines are coming into play. Um, we've got this story that Labour calls for um, a kind of, uh, kind of uh, censoring in some way Facebook or social media posts which are uh, against vaccinations, um, which which I found quite strange uh, because another story here is this, this opinion piece says uh, we've got to be gentle on vaccines and talk the people into it gently. Um, what, what's, what's, and there's a, there's a picture of someone who's put vaccine as poison on a, on a bus stop. What's your view on that, Shanali? Are you muted? Did I mute you? Oh, did I mute you? Sorry, no, I'm, I, I muted myself because our kid came in and he started babbling. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's for, it for the other viewers' sake. Um, yeah, no, this is, um, we've got, this is a real, this is, we've got ourselves into a right quagmire here, basically, haven't we? Because um, the, like, so I remember when I was younger, and I don't want to blame everything on Blair, <laughs> but I remember in the early 2000s, the big, uh, there was a, a great big fuss about whether, the Blairs had given one of their children the MMR vaccine. And this was around the same time, some of you might remember, when uh, a complete um, a complete gangster called Andrew Wakefield um, helped disseminate a conspiracy theory about, about the MMR va vaccine, the combined vaccine. Um, incidentally, also ran an extremely expensive private clinic that offered the single vaccine the same time so it's you know a bit of profiteering in there um but that spoke to an enormous lack of trust in politicians but Blair was central to that as well I mean I think we can identify a lot of this sort of vacuum and this complete breakdown of trust between us you know the electorate and politicians can be pointed back to Blair him lying about the WMDs and then this was like another sort of like public health scandal that really they were at the centre of so there's a real problem here because we, you know, like we've got a government who are trying to um, have been trying to propel herd immunity through the population without a vaccine, which is murderous, absolutely murderous. It's, it's just resulting in the elderly and the vulnerable just being just fed to this fed to this virus, basically. Um, and now we've got a vaccine, which we should all be very happy about. But there's like there, but there's just a basic mistrust in, in the vaccine. And it's not. And I, I'm absolutely pro vaccines. All like you know, our kids are vaccinated. Um, I would take this vaccine in a heartbeat. But it's also sort of understandable that there's this big gaping hole of, of mistrust, isn't there, between people who, who, um, yeah, who would ordinarily probably want to protect themselves and their families, but don't trust the government. I don't trust the government on a lot of things. It's a bit of a mess, basically. I don't think Labour saying just shut up and just like. Especially considering the current context from Starmer telling us all to shut up about Corbyn. I don't think this is going to be very effective. I think this seems like a really poor political strategy to try and, you know, introduce sort of like censorship. Um, there's, you know, there's a real problem here. Like there's a political vacuum here and like we should be filling it as socialists. And it's unfortunate that we're in a, a situation where things need to happen fast. Um and we need time to start to, to to rebuild that trust again. But this is like this speaks absolutely speaks to the breakdown of trust, and 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 understandably um, so. But it's going to be really devastating if people don't take up the vaccine. Right, uh, owing to time constraints, I'm going to move on to the next story for you, John, um, which I thought you might be interested in. Was this uh, 30th anniversary of? Uh, 
Jeffrey Howe's speech where he um, demolished Margaret Thatcher. Um, what what was your memory of that of that speech, John? Do you do you remember seeing it? I, re I remember it vaguely now. I mean, I, I just hated everybody who was part of Thatcher's government uh, at that time. My most memory, uh, memor memorable uh, moment was when Dennis Ely said it was being like being savaged by a, a dead sheep. And to see him being turned into some sort of roaring lion 30 years later is, is a bit much. I mean, again, like today, there were divisions emerging uh, inside the Tory party. Thatcher's iron grip on, on the party uh, was weakening because uh, people were starting to rise up against Thatcherism, the poll tax, uh, ev everything else. And, and she was becoming more and more unpopular. Now, the thing about the Tories, unlike when Corbyn was leader is, of, of the Labour Party is they're prepared to get rid of their opposition and they're prepared to be as brutal as anything. So when it came to cutting off a king... Oh, John? ...whether Howard made that famous speech, she would have gone. She was on her way out. She, you know, she was a remnant of something that the Tories wanted to be rid of, and and you know, unfortunately, the only opposition they got at that time was was Neil Kinnock. So uh, they, you know, they thought opportune get rid of her, uh, and and the fact that they they put in a grey man and uh, you know a Keith Starmer lookalike in John Major, if you like. It shows uh, that you know what they were going for then, uh, but you know I don't think Jeffrey Howe had, uh, had a great deal to do with it. He, he personified it, if you like, in uh, in that speech. Nothing isn't it? More. Isn't it interesting that the the way they've done history is that one guy put took her down, where he had all the resistance to her from all these exactly, movements, exactly. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then yeah. they painted it as like one guy. With a with a few turns of a page can can get rid of a um, you know that's the way they've they've tried to, to well, paint it. that's that's the cheap media that's uh, cheap reporting it, you know everything is about individuals you know we were taught at school that this king gave us that this king gave us everything that not never that anybody had to fight for anything and, and our great strike if you listen to the media it was still about uh, Arthur Scargill and Margaret Thatcher, not about an onslaught on trade unionism. So it's, it's how the media like, they, they do like a figure, a bit like, you know, Dominic, Dominic Cummings and yeah. concentrating on the personalities. OK, well, look, we're going to move on to the final story. Uh, Janali, what's your, what's your take on, I mean, you could be listening into this now if you wanted to. Sorry to keep you from it. I think it's just started or it's about to. Uh, Keir Starmer's on Desert Island Discs, apparently he likes Stormzy, uh, but he also likes um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of stuff that appeals to a wide section of people, apparently. So he, he's, his, his musical tastes reflect the, the kind of voter that he might be wanting to pick up. Is that a coincidence, do you think? There you go, unmuted. There you go. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, yes. This is all quite embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, especially the Stormzy stuff. Um, I'd like to hear um, Keir Starmer talk about policies. I'm not so interested in <laughs> hearing about how he just happens to like Northern Soul, the Grenfell single, and also loves football, apparently. Um, that's not of great interest to me. That feels a little bit like an awful throwback to another time. Um, called the 90s <laughs> and um, this is it's yeah it's it it, it just feels um, there's a there's a, it feels like there's a triangulation here he says that he says that this is all bona fide you know what he really loves to listen to um, but honestly this sort of stuff um, we just want to know we want to know like are you going to water down the, the green industrial revolution policy care that's of great a great interest to us actually <laughs> we want to know if you're going to fight the Tories on austerity 
this stuff, it feels a bit like um, trying to sort of, um, a bit like the election, you know, the leadership election. It feels a bit like um, playing to the crowd, but not really much substance. Yeah, I, th I thought this thing about him, his euphoria at singing um, the England football anthem at Wembley was a little bit over the, over the top, <laughs> trying to get the old uh, national vote. Uh, nationalist, or, uh, pat sorry, patriotic uh, vote. I don't know if to mix the two up. Um, uh, John, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're you're uh, you're itching to turn on Radio Four right now. Um, what, which particular bit of his musical taste do you like most? Uh, I can't say I, I identified with anything. I, I quite like Stormzy. I'm not into that sort of genre of music. But if if Keir Starmer is into Stormzy, then I'll start listening to Coldplay. Uh, that's more his style, I think. Something boring that you can lull yourself to sleep with at night that's as grey as he is. And I should imagine that he's got this invite, and it's interesting that, you know, this... Uh, I don't think Corbyn were ever invited to go on to... I've never listened to Radio 4, to be honest, uh, uh, in my life, to my knowledge. And uh, so... I know nothing about the format of Desert Island this. When I read it, I thought I actually jumped for joy. I thought he'd been marooned on a desert island. Now, but I should imagine that some aide, you know, with a with a Keir Starmer haircut and a shiny suit and pointy shoes has gone rushing in and said, you know, Sir Keith, when, you, when you're on Desert Island this, mention Stormzy because the young folks are down there with him. A northern soul, because it's got northern in it. We need to build, rebuild the <laughs> northern red wall, remember. But if Starmer is into that sort of music, then I'll eat my hat. I have to admit, my, I'm, I'm a dedicated Leonard Cohen and Bruce Springsteen fan and, and Tom Waits and listen to very, very little other other than that. So okay. I, I can't identify with this music choice just as I can't identify with Stammeroid himself. All right, well th thank you John and thank you uh, Shanali, uh, good to see you again. Good to see you Chris Bim. And But we have we, we have with us uh, uh, someone who's been re-elected to the NEC um, and uh, did very well. Uh, Anne Black, are you there? Yeah. Oh thank you for joining yeah. us Anne. Um, so um, yeah, so you you've come back onto the NEC. You've been on the NEC for for a while before then. Uh, before you've just come on, when, when did you first get elected? Two thousand. So two thousand twenty eighteen. Okay. Um, can I just say? I mean, I've been following the chat with a great deal of interest um, during the early part um, because I'm interested in what members would like me to tell. Um, Keir Starmer and the NEC and the first meeting is I think the 24th of November. So if I could summarise the message that I'm picking up, it is fuck Starmer, resign now. Now I called people out when they said that kind of thing about Jeremy. Okay. And I'm consistent uh, in the leader was elected with an overall majority and a mandate. So um, you know, that, sorry that that's not a message I'm going to take, but uh, I appreciate it, what a, a lot of members feel. Well, so I, I mean, I could, with me. I could ch turn off the chat, um, but I, we don't normally do that because people fine. allow people to say meeting. what they like and um, it's a kind of open, open forum. Yeah, but sure. um, I think it describes an anger that there is about what's going on with particularly what's happening with this, the CLPs well, not actually, being... Actually, I, I, um, I think what's interesting is the anger that I picked up was not stating clear Labour policies, and I actually share. Um, I'm not sure if anger is putting it too strongly, but I certainly feel that um, Keir Starmer as leader and the Labour Party needs to be coming out with policies that everyone can be get behind, like protecting private tenants, keeping the uplift to universal credit until we can replace it with something better, uh, protecting jobs and all the rest of it. So 
Um, and on vaccines, I mean, I whether it's right or wrong to try to ban anti-vaxxers, I actually think it won't work. It so won't. it sort of goes off to one side in that <laughs> trying to keep stuff off social media is really <laughs> beyond anyone's power. So that's... Um, so have you, can I ask you what you've seen in the chat? Do you think that this this uh, la this last NEC election was a div more divisive election than any ones we've had before? Um, no. No. What what's what? I mean, because you used to be part of the slate, the left slate, yeah. uh, whatever it's called. I, I, I can't remember the names, but. Um, you then that's, came that's off. Gone through, gone through various names, yeah. And then, and then you came off the slate, and that you were on a new slate this time. I was supported by Open Labour, and my campaign team was four part-time volunteers who did graphics and social media. So it wasn't really, if you, it, it wasn't really a slate in the sense of phone banks and massive membership lists. But nevertheless, I'm very grateful for them. And um, but what, do you, what, do you, what do you? What can I change the subject a bit? What? What do you? Because uh, it's a bit. I'm. I'm I wasn't uh, expecting this for the, the the intro with people. <laughs> I've had half an hour to think and about. I, it, I never. I never really expected <laughs> to hear you swear, even though you were quoting um, someone else. Um, what What I wanted to ask you is, what do you think? Uh, the priorities are for the Labour Party um, now, as you're now on the NEC, what do you think the priorities are? Um, well, to start talking to voters rather than each other, to get campaigns in place, to get more money down to local members on the ground, where, because we actually do the campaigning on the doorstep when we're allowed to go on doorstep, uh, to let local parties select parliamentary candidates in good time, you could about excuse 2017 because nobody, nobody predicted that election. But for the NEC to impose candidates twice in less than three years is not, I don't understand it and it's not acceptable. So that one thing is getting candidates in place, but public facing, um, it's difficult given the way that the pandemic swamps everything. Um, which means we need to get heard on other things. Uh, do you, we need do you to think do more that, of that? Do you think that the Labour Party is too top down in its uh, ad, uh, organisation and governance, because, especially with the pandemic? I mean, because people need resources, as you say, on the ground. Um, we've the CLPs have such small amount from each uh, member subscription, and at the same time as that. CLPs are being given directives about what they can say um, with certain issues. Uh, is that is that is that undermining local parties too much? Well, of course, the directive was in, issued by Jenny Formby in 2019 uh, in the first place, and all David Evans did was um, repeat it. I mean, I'm just pasting in. Uh, Jenny Formby's um, instruction 18 months ago. So um, somebody at my own all member meeting last night um, suggested that there was a fundamental difference. So I dug out the original and it's there. Um, I think the other thing that's unfortunate is uh, that it's being personalized around the general secretary who acts with the authority of the NEC. And if you want to blame anyone, it should be, if members want to blame anyone, uh, it should be the NEC. And obviously from now that includes me. So, you know, feel free to have a go. But we've actually had a trade unionist voting, speaking and voting against some of these motions because they attack members of staff who have employment rights and deserve trade union representation. So I'd be a bit, you know, the general secretary, if, if he or she steps out of line, it's the NEC that's ultimately responsible. So the buck stops here, not with David Evans. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, what, what, what did you think about the result itself? 
Uh, did you, were you surprised by the number of people from the, the respective slates that got elected? I, I realised that I do not understand single transferable votes. I mean, anyone that's looked at the analysis and goes through 54 rounds, uh, I don't really understand that at all. I was um, hoping that uh, George Linda Salmond would get elected and he missed by 0.3 as a percentage, which is, um, you know, you just think, and given that it was only disabled members who voted in the CLP section, you think if I could have talked to 20 more people, I could have done it. And um, Jermaine Jackman, who I don't know if people have heard Jermaine, but he's, he's um, stunningly yeah, impressive. Um, we had him on a, a, a hustings. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, he was either, I can't work out if he was 10th or 11th, but he was very, very close. So I'm disappointed that he didn't get on and George didn't get on. Um, otherwise, I personally am happy with a wide range of political views, diver, political diversity, because See, then every member can look at the NEC and say, oh, well, there's someone that speaks like me, whether it's um, uh, Anne Black or Luke Akers or whoever, so, um, or Gemma Bolton. And I know Gemma's from the Southeast Regional Board, of course, so we'll be... Um, we'll be sitting next to each other. The NEC sits alphabetically. <laughs> When's the first meeting that you've got then? 24th of November. Right. Uh, will you come back on for uh, updates? And I'll try and tell people to not swear in the chat. It's okay. People swear in real life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, your, it's your meeting. Um, we're discussing whether to disable the chat in our meeting or not. But it's, um, you know, I'm a guest. You're All right. So, uh, but yes, I'm happy to come back whenever. That would um, be great. I mean, I know you normally do, you're, you're known for giving updates on what happens in the meetings. It would be good if we could have regular updates on Zoom as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and, in, so it's on the 24th. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So I invited everyone who's been um, elected to the NEC to come on the, on the chat. How, today. how many of them accepted? Well, I'm just going to tell you that. Um, you have in, you have accepted, and Mish has accepted. Mish, are you there? Hiya, Crispin. Good morning. Uh, congratulations on being uh, elected to the NEC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who uh, voted for the grassroots voice, and thank you for everybody who got selected. Um, now, uh, what did you think about the the split between the votes so that the, the grassroots voice got five uh, elected did you think that was a good result i think that was an excellent result i think uh we uh this is it's an stv it's the first time it's ever happened nobody could put their finger on uh, what what how it would go or what would work out based on the uh rebecca long bailey results uh in uh february uh when we had the elections then and it was a single transferable vote we, we picked up that a certain percentage of the vote will dictate uh, how many people we get on. So we, we, if we get 30% of the vote, we would get three people on from our slate. For us to get 37% of the vote and to elect five people was, a, was just down to our strategy of the regional preferences. We were able to maximise our vote and make sure that we got uh, more transfers and more spread between all of us. So to get five of us on, uh, when many expected maybe four, uh, it's been an absolutely great result. And uh, it's all down to members voting discipline as well. Uh, I think the left have often been uh, uh, remarked as being not disciplined, but this time the left have done a really good job in voting with great discipline and making sure that the vote was maximised properly. Yeah, I thought, uh, looking at the results, I thought, because um, Luke Akers was the, the, had the highest vote, but that was because his slate, everyone seemed to put him number one. Um, so he pulled most of the votes from that slate and it, it, made, the, it made their slate um, f drop out quite, the other ones didn't do so well at all. Whereas what you say about the regional differences that, um, that the grassroots voice slate did worked very well. So strategically i think you know it was a it was a masterstroke doing that um but then 
the turnout was 27 percent is that uh is that a concern to you of course it's a concern to me it's an absolute I mean, the Labour Party internal election were, were Labour Party, which is meant to be a member-led party, uh, for have a turnout, and it's such an important election as well, uh, where the direction of the party will be determined. It just goes to show how leadership control freakery has really put people off, and uh, the member-led democracy part of the party is is, is been uh, it's, it's been tarnished and. People are being demoralised, and that's why people have, uh, many have left. I mean, we had 6,000 votes. We don't know what happened to them, so I won't comment there. We'll find out. But 6,000 votes, when there's a quota of 12,000 to get elected, just wiped off. What for, when for, we'll probably find out later. But it's a lot of mistrust in the party, and this is trust that we've got to build with our members as well. Because unless we build this trust with our members, our members aren't going to be campaigning and, and for the party. And if our members aren't campaigning for the party, then you're not going to get a Labour government or Labour councillors or Labour MPs elected. Uh, so it's all good finding voters and, and talking to voters and making voters ready. But we've got to get our members on side. And to do this, we've got to stop this, uh, this, this, this attack on the members. Um, and... Yeah, so what, what's, uh, I've, I've had a question in, I've only had actually one person ask me to send questions in, uh, and only one question's come in, I don't know if you want to answer it, but the question is, do you think Jeremy Corbyn should be reinstated to the party without conditions? I'm not going to make a comment publicly, and I haven't all the way through, for a specific reason. People, can, people know where my politics lie, and where I am from, but, uh, but this, is, this must, must, might be discussed on the NEC, and uh, you don't want to prejudice yourself uh, by saying your personal opinion on the case. Uh, so then when somebody has got a chance to defend somebody who's been treated unjustly, uh, you get you excuse yourself from that panel. So I'm not going to do that. I will uh, right. okay. make no, my case no on worry. the NEC. No, I, no, I don't. I'm not going to try and tr put you in a... In a... No, no, but I know, no, I'm, I know you're not meant to, but just so people understand that, uh, any injustice has to be looked at and I don't want to uh, excuse myself from a panel where we're looking at any injustice that I could maybe play a part in solving an injustice. And what's what's your, uh, are you able to talk about the uh, Ford inquiry? Is, is that something you can speak about? What, what's your hopes from that? Uh, the Ford inquiry was an eye-opener for for us all, and especially somebody uh, of a BAME background, the, uh, the alleged racism uh, towards uh, black members of parliament and the uh, misogyny and all the stuff that come out of it. I mean, it was it was quite shocking. And in addition to that, the uh, claims of sabotage. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna make a comment now as I would have done maybe six months ago. Uh, on, on what, what my views are, but uh, I am looking forward to the results of the Ford inquiry, and I think uh, whatever the results are, we'll have to scrutinise them and see uh, where we need to pick up on and what we need to do. Can I? Can I? I know. I, I think it's it's interesting that NEC members seem to be put in a difficult position to comment because of your your what responsibilities you might have. So I don't want you to be put into that, but. What I noticed from the leak was that the administration of the Labour Party seems to be making decisions without the, um, without consulting the NEC. Um, that was alarming to many members. How do you think the NEC can make sure it imposes itself on the administration rather than the other way around? Well, this, I've, I've just read in the chat somewhere something along these lines where... Uh, I don't get it. It's a member-led organisation, so we are we. The Labour Party is our party. It's it, it seems to be the other way around, where paid employees run the show, and we have to fall into line with what's going on there. Uh, it's it, that that can't happen if we're going to have a member-led uh, culture of where members come first. So this is something again. The NEC is going to have to look into how this culture is how this culture is revisited because it's not it's not healthy culture 
I mean, do you think that might be partly why people didn't vote so much in this election? If people in their heart don't feel that the NEC is running the party and that it is other people who are running it, then they may not think it's worth bothering to vote, that, it, that whoever's on the NEC can't make much difference. Do you think that might have something to do with it? I, I, I assume you, I, I, you are correct. I've, I had a look at the fallout of the NEC yesterday uh, and what, what, what kind of formation it is. So of this, uh, and might correct me, there's 38 or 39 people who are on the NEC and only nine of them represent members. So uh, if the members specifically wanted something uh, to lobby their CLP reps uh, and all nine of us agreed, uh, although there's nine of us from different parts of the party, uh, or, although if, even if we all did agree, we still would have to go up against the leadership, we'd have to go up against the trade unions, we'd have to go up against the, uh, the PLP reps and the shadow cabinet reps. We don't have a majority, so if it's going to be a member-led organisation for a quarter of the NEC to be uh, representing members, if that is, if that, I mean, that tips the balance away from the membership there. So this is something that the organisation might have to think about. Right. Well, look, I'm, I'm, uh, thank, you, thank you for coming on. Will you come on again, as Anne said, she'd do an update. We, if, if I <laughs> facilitate an update, maybe we can have um, get these going every month and then people can feel more connection with the... I, 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 I committed to you before, before during the election, Crispin. I will come back whenever you invite me, time allowing, capacity allowing. I'll be here to update everybody and I will be sticking to our promises of surgeries uh, and uh, updates regularly of what goes on and even uh, meetings before the NEC uh, to find out what people want to raise as well. So just invite me and I'll be there if I can. Yeah. Thank you very much and, and uh, good luck on the 24th, your first one. Cheers. Thank you, everybody, again. Cheers, Mish. Um, now I'm going to speak to um, Esther Giles, who missed out um, in the Treasury uh, position in the vote for Treasurer. Esther, are you there? Yeah, and I'm still a member, actually. That's okay. surprising, isn't it? <laughs> well, well, don't don't speak too soon. Um, what I wanted what I wanted to um, to ask you about, really, because we haven't got very long, but I did want to ask how 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 on earth are you supposed to be? How can anyone challenge the existing treasurer when there's a trade union vote uh, as well as a member vote? I mean, it must be impossible. I don't think that anyone's ever beaten the existing treasurer before. Is that, is, that, is that an issue that needs to be looked at? I mean, it has to be more open than that, surely. Yeah, I, I said this in the hustings, actually, that the fact that the unions can dictate who the party treasurer is even if 90% of CLPs voted for somebody to be treasurer, um, the union block vote would prevent that happening. So CLPs do not have a say in, in the way that the treasurer is elected at present. Um, there are a number of ways that we could get around this. We could, um, we could change the rules about the union block vote. We could ask for a job share. Um, we could ask for the post to be rotated but the current approach is not fair to CLPs. Well, because if if you have the same person in a position for, I don't know, is it six, seven, eight years? Is it Longer eight? than that. It's yeah. more than a decade, I think. It just doesn't seem like the right way to do things. Um, and, um, and also, I think the party, the Labour Party finances, I mean, unions contribute to the Labour Party finances a, a, a large amount. But it shouldn't mean that unions are in control in some way of who the treasurer of the party is. Is that? No, is they that do. Fair? They do. They, they do contribute a large amount, but so do members. Um, so there needs to be a democratic approach um, to shining a light on the on the party finances and CLP members. The membership um, do need to have that accountability to them and that transparency of the figures. And they're not getting it at the moment. Um, and unless we're careful, they're not going to get that for the next two years, at well, least. And, and I, I'm going to I'm going to bring in Mark uh, McDonald because Mark, you stood for treasurer before as well, didn't you? Yeah, I stood against Jack Dromey many years ago and faced the same problem that the treasurer's position is 
effectively one that's always been allocated to the trade unions. And I remember during the election being called in when Jack Dromey was, I think, Deputy Secretary, with his political secretary, John Cryer, into what is now the Unite Building in Holborn and being told by Jack Dromey, why am I challenging him? Because I'm going to lose, because he's going to vote for himself. None of the other unions are going to participate, and that means he's run. And that's effectively the, the, the Treasurer's position, unfortunately. And it hasn't changed, and it's the only position, I think, that still has that same union block vote uh, as part of its elective. But what I... What I want to talk about, if I can, very quickly, is the... Is You're the a lawyer. I, remember, let's remember, you are a lawyer and you yes. speak quite... You speak very well, um, but we haven't got very long. So it, I, it, I know, but... A uh, couple of minutes. Yes, and I'll try and get it in. But you and I have spoken both online and offline in relation to the slate issue. Yeah. And um, can I start by congratulating Mish and congratulating... Uh, all those from the grassroots six of the well the five that, that got on and and fantastic job it shows the presence still and the strength of the left within the labor movement and and great campaign but there is something fundamentally problematic with the slate system remember when i started this campaign you and i talked about this about the issue of the nec and about the fact that the nec lacked transparency lacked accountability uh, secret meetings, discussions going on um, off agenda. And you and I remember, and I think I spoke about the fact when I was representing Jeremy Corbyn before the NEC uh, and how things transpired there. And so my, my greatest concern has been this, this whole thing. And I think what's done and what's happened with the slate system is that it's just contributed to that lack of transparency because you've got to remember that there was no democratic mandate mandate behind the any of those slates, any of the individuals, both on the left and the right, that have formed slates. I mean, Luke effectively set up an organisation called, I think, Labour First, and then made himself the first person on preference to stand for the NEC elections. The the the, the, the left slate um, was dealt with, I think, you know, no criteria, no selection uh, procedure properly done. Um, uh, over a weekend, suddenly we're all presented. Now, you and I spoke, Crispin, a number of times about how we're going to make sure that we don't split the left vote because that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that the left came, but we were presented with a fait accompli of, of a selection of people um, that was effectively decided over one weekend. Uh, and I think it causes massive concerns about how we go forward because. What we're doing is we're simply contributing to a lack of transparency within the NEC by presenting ourselves with a fait accompli in relation to slates. And you cannot win, you cannot win on the NEC unless you're part of a slate. As an individual, I can see John Wiseman there, and you, and me, we cannot win, it would seem, and we need to really start thinking about the whole process of how we elect our representatives on the NEC because fundamentally it is flawed and we need to reform it. Uh, and we need to get rid of slates. We just simply need to get rid of slates. Um, uh, how that happens, I don't know. Um, but we should be individual policies and we need to be able to say why you should elect John Wiseman, why well, you should elect Crispin, why you should elect me. Yeah, well look, I, I'm, I'm going to actually, you, you've just, you've, you've hosted the, the show here because I was just going to ask John Wiseman what what his, his view is. Um, John, uh, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there, brother. Yeah. Uh, now, John, you, you did a fantastic uh, attempt to, to to get elected. I saw every day you did loads and loads of social media. You were pushing for different groups to support you. Um, I couldn't find any fault in your uh, your attempts to do this, but. Uh, as Mark was saying, the slate thing was impossible to to get round. Now, what's your view? Do you do you? Well, I'm going to give anyone, some credit to the. Let me finish. Sorry, do you think anyone? Do you think that anyone can win without a slate? Yes, but it would uh, but it would harm splitting the left. Let me just. What I've realised from the votes and the results is give credit a bit to momentum. They did try and do some interviews. They did do a selection process. Alan, I know Alan Gibbons was involved, other people. So that on that little grouping within the left, but the whole of the left has had a, a problem here, really, in the past of selecting people. It's been done in London by a small group of people, um, usually 12 with the chair of the CLGA, and then li other little groups would put in 
uh, the LRC, which I was on the executive of. So there was a little bit of democracy in the left. On the right, there never has been. They just pick a list. Um, that Labour to win, Labour first, whatever. I want to start by congratulating the GV5 of, of the GV6. I think they're all decent people. And to be honest, I haven't got a problem with any of them. Um, my concern with the slates is it's democratically chosen. And that means having hustings, like sort of happened within momentum, uh, having hustings, having the opportunity for Mark yourself, because everyone offers something different and equality comes up. The, rep, the lack of black representation on the, the uh, NEC. Uh, we had a trans candidate, uh, Catherine Foy, brilliant, you know, uh, brilliant, blew the uh, discussion wide open. We had lots of good things about this NEC election. And I tried to talk to everybody, I'll be honest with you, on the left. I just kept on promoting everybody. Because in the end of the day, what turned out to be the case is I went, I didn't even vote for myself, number one, because I wanted the left slate to get on. But the point was we were empowered because I had Yasmin Dardan uh, from our region. The problem we had was trying to get left-wingers in at the point of like not getting you in, Crispin, because I promoted you, Mark. Young Cameron Mitchell, who's I think is a star and going to go far, um, who's a younger trade unionist from Bolsover. The point is, I just think that when denying some people access, it's accessibility and it comes down to equality. We're denying accessibility to the NEC and that's the problem. And I think the slates, I think the left do it better, but need transparency and access to allow people to stand who are credible. And the point is they're not saying the others aren't credible, but it gives them even more credibility. I think the left could wipe the floor on this. I think we could have got nine elected. I just think if we had a bit more strategy and used our heads a bit more, we could have won all nine. And that could have been you, Crispin, Mark, could have been young Cameron Mitchell, could have been, you know, a whole no load of names who were good left wingers on that on that NEC. I right. just want to say thanks to all supporters, but slates need reform, accessibility. Equality, hustings, allowing people to stand on the left. It needs more transparency. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I find it, it's, it must be, I mean, I didn't particularly think, I never thought I'd, I'd get on to the NEC. I just wanted to raise that issue about the funding. That was my whole point of the campaign. And I'm going to keep using um, everything I can to push that because I don't think party can survive unless some of those red ball seats have funding. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming on. Thank you, Anne, for um, for, for coming on. And I know everyone's saying congratulations to the to the five, but I'd like to congratulate Anne as well. Um, congratulations. And, uh, and and for coming on as well, because there's two of you out of nine, so you are the chosen two. Are you there, Susie? Hi. Now there's a story in the in the paper in the. Um, Observer, it's a comment about uh, Michael Parkinson has said that um, that that fe women are not as funny as as men. Um, now, Susie, I think you're one of the funniest people on the planet. How does it Aww. how does it feel to be a, a comedian who's put down in that way? Is that it's it's quite a normal thing, isn't it, for women? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's a major eye roll because it get said uh, so i wasn't really listening to most of the last speakers because i was just polishing my funny women award um just uh this award that i won for being funny years ago um it was modeled on me can you tell uh yeah so um uh, funny women awards winner thank you very much <laughs> michael parkinson go off and uh, play with your parker pen michael parkinson um yeah, it gets said all the time. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, it is women who come up to you after gigs and they say, oh, I don't normally like female comedians. And they think it's a compliment. And, and you just think, oh, no, listen to what you're saying. And you kind of smile graciously and go, but it does happen. And sometimes you feel like the room tenses up because you come out and you're a woman and you feel like you have to work a bit harder. And sometimes you get the classic... Um, the compare has to warn the audience that you're a woman before you come on. Wow. And I, I had it once. I did this golfing day and um, the guy came on and told the audience, oh, we've got a female comedian coming on. And you could feel you could see the whole audience go, huh? <laughs> I was like, what, what is this? <laughs> and, um, and then he said, oh, apparently she's quite good. And I was like, thanks for that, because that was the worst thing. It's like they have to apologise before you before you come on. But um, I just 
I tend to sort of ignore it really because um, Sarah Millican gets asked about it a lot and she's decided to take the stance of just not really answering the question anymore because it's given it oxygen. Um, but it is, I mean, I've, I someone just mentioned Victoria, but I've got our book here. Um, Victoria Wood, Dawn French, Kathy Burke, Carolina Hearn, you know, all these amazing comedians. And um, for some reason, it's still there in people in the back of people's heads. I don't know why. I don't know where it came from, but it's there somewhere. And, and it's just best to just ignore it, really, because it just gives it more. If you start listing all the, the amazing comedians out there that are female, it's just like you're sort of pandering to it. And um, unfortunately, people do still like, well, don't go and watch a female comedian then, Michael Parkinson, stay in and uh, we'll all go off and have the fun without you. But yeah, it happens. <laughs> it's, nice, it's nice when you prove people wrong. <laughs> oh, look, Patrick, Patrick, you're in the car now. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, driving, I'm driving over to the West Country to pick up that award from Susie. I can't believe I'm, I want to just, <laughs> I want to buy what that award of her. Well done. He's a Susie. bit of brasso. I know it's brilliant. Do you know when I saw you polishing it before you said where it was, I thought, what? The, what is that? What is Susie got there? So so what, do you do you what do you think, Patrick? Do you, are you are you a fan of uh, female comedians? Oh yeah, of course. And and I mean, look, we we've, we've all uh, I've known Susie for years and years. We've seen her on here everywhere, and she is she's one of the funniest comedian comedians comedians it's not i don't think it's like a female or male thing i think it's just funny funny is funny and i think that's the that's the most important thing that people forgot in the past where yeah do you remember i mean you remember what it was like when we first did comedy i remember first coming down to london and doing open spots and you'd be you'd be like uh, this new act on a bill with like five uh blokes five middle-aged blokes and they'd all be talking about the same thing and i felt sorry a bit for the audience because i thought it's just another act doing the same doing the act doing the same and literally just before lockdown before the second lockdown i did uh my second last gig was on a bill and all the acts were female apart from me it was just a normal night it wasn't planned like that they just put you know book four female acts and me whatever and it was a great gig no one complained and it was a great night and that's exactly how it should be you know it's not like because yeah. people never used to did the Susie people never it, back in the day, you know, if there was like four or five male comics, no one ever got, oh, God, everyone's male like that. But because yeah. people just expect it like that, and it, it shouldn't be, because it is quite dull like that. You need to mix it up. And actually, Susie, I was in, um, at Christmas, I was chatting to you, so I was in Plymouth, and I didn't realise Susie was bloody in Plymouth. You were from there, but you were in Bristol that night. And I was on that gig, um, and it was brilliant. It was two female acts, and I was one of the other male acts. So it was perfect. It was 50-50, and that's... You know, it's not that hard now. It shouldn't be that hard. You know, people go, oh, there's not enough female acts to put. Of course there is, but it's just Oh, there's people... loads, but you just yeah. don't see it often, I guess. Because people yeah. put you into a category, like being yeah. female is a genre of comedy. Like they've got a musical act, a stand-up yeah. act, um, a, a character act, a female act, as if it's you're know, like in a genre. It's, yeah. It's, but, um... uh, uh, so, Don, Don, what's, your, what's your view? Are you, are you a fan of... Female comedians, or you don't notice any difference, or what? What? what how do you? I've got nothing to add to this issue, Crispin. No. But no one's going to go after this show and say male comedians are not funny. So yeah. So so even if I've got nothing to say about it, <laughs> the thing is, it, it shouldn't matter. Um, <laughs> oh, it shouldn't matter what gender you are. Susie's one of the funniest yeah. people I know. End of. So is Patrick, so yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Shouldn't yeah. Everyone, everyone would say that. I think I think uh, Michael Parkinson's uh, shown himself up again. Um, uh, I mean, Chris, well, he, Michael, he, he, yeah. he famously told Helen Mirren her, her boobs distract from her performance. So I don't think we really <laughs> listen to anything exactly. he's got to say. Oh, well, I know exactly. <laughs> and Parkinson, Michael Parkinson's about two hundred and fifty-seven years old. Apparently, <laughs> I think. I think it, on his. I remember watching some of his first shows, and he had dinosaurs on there. He was like literally from before <laughs> Jurassic Park was even invented. So I think it is. It does just show, doesn't it, how we've changed so much? Thankfully, in the in a brilliant way. Oh, I see. Yeah. What you mean. He's 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 out of date. He's he's not keeping up. It's with just it. yeah, it's a shame because you'd think he was actually quite an intelligent bloke back then. It's just it's a shame. I think it's just yeah, he's just sort of outdated. But he's quite funny. Susie, you said about uh, about the golf club, and I think that is hilarious. They are. I've done them gigs, you know where, and I don't know, Chris, Ben, Don, you've probably done the same. Where you turn up and. People always say to me, what's the toughest gig? And I always say, look, all gigs, it doesn't matter where they are. They always say, is it easier up north, down south? It doesn't matter which region you are. You could be anywhere. You could be on the moon. And I always say the easiest or the best gigs is where 
and there's everyone in there. It's a good mix. You know, I've done yeah, the gigs where you turn up. In, in that right, where you turn up, and Sue's used it, where you turn up, they go, oh, you're going to have a right laugh here. They're, they're such jokers. It's a great gig. And I say, all right. And then turn, it's just, you're the only comic on. And it's 200 blokes. And all they've done is play golf and collect stamps all their life. And, then, <laughs> and, they're, and they're hilarious with each other or whatever. Or they just, and they'll go, um, yeah, we don't mind a bit of sexist, racist, homophobic, humor. And, and you say, well, this isn't, you know, I don't know anyone. I think you've booked the wrong act, you know. And it's, yeah. and and they are the they're the toughest gigs where it's just all blokes, and oh, probably yeah. the same if it's all just all females or if it's all just all people yeah. of a so that you want the whole point of comedy is that you want everyone from every background, every age, and every yeah. sex really. Do you know Definitely. that um, earlier on in the year um, I did a gig in London and I was comparing and it was Saturday night Piccadilly Circus, and the mm -hmm. first two rows were two stag nights. And I was really nervous. I thought, oh, no, they're going to hate me. It's going to be horrible. But they were the, they were so lovely and they were loving it. They were yeah. up for it. And they, they invited me out with them afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not always just all blokes, but it's not, the golf club thing seems to be a bit, yeah. they've kind of left their wives at home. So they don't want to see a yeah. woman. Exactly. Unless it's a mistake well, think, or it's yeah. a wife. I, um, I think, but, you know, I think the, 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 the yeah. last thing I'll say on it is like yeah. these kind of articles, we, it's, been, it's been going on for years. People said, oh, women funny. And I think mm -hmm. the best thing to do is just, just to ignore it and just roll your eyes rather than get angry yeah. with it because it's just exactly. that's just someone's opinion and it doesn't bother us because we 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 get paid for being funny and that's that yeah. so if you don't yeah. want to go and see a female comedian don't do it but you're missing out <laughs> yes exactly yeah i was at that same gig with susie uh with the stag foods and that's where she met big willie so <laughs> <laughs> the truth the truth will always come out that's he did actually well, see me at a gig the first time he ever saw me saw me at a gig and took a shine to me so yeah you know oh, <laughs> no. oh, okay. are we going to move on now to to rob uh who's been waiting there rob are you there yeah 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 hello uh, now you've written a you've written a song especially for the show yes uh, about uh it's about dominic cummings yeah, where where can Dominic's coming? Where can Dominic Cummings go when he's gone? So where is Dominic Cummings going to go? Well, here's every comfort hard hearts could desire: your own wing-backed armchair, your own private fire, the Times and the Telegraph, Spectator and Mail. Where do you go? when you don't go to jail. The chipping sod off Bury gated community, home for right-wing shits like you. Who's that with his old faithful Clegg at his side? One man and his pig, once the Burlington's pride. Why, it's Cameron, of course. This is all his idea, with John Major to thank For those pints of warm beer At the Chipping Sod off Bury Gated community, home for right-wing shits like you There's Victorian sponge cake We call Thatcher's handbag A rich brandy fruit cake called Old Winston Sandbag Cocktails are served at 1933. Why not try a Mosley or a Marzellini at the Chipping Sod off Bury Gated Community, home for right wing shits like you? When you've done all your damage and made all you could, well, take Tony Blair. Oh, we wish someone would, but he's a shining example of how to afford with memoirs and lectures and seats on the board. The chipping sod off Bury gated community, home for right wing shits like you. Now, Dominic's coming. We're all so excited. Long drives in the country. He's bound to be knighted. And Donald plays golf with his chum Johnny Rotten. Where those unforgivable get quietly 
forgotten. At the chipping sword off Burry Gated Community, home for right wing shits like you.